Thank you so much, Derek, for helping us out with this Garden Victoriously program. I'm going to hand it right over to you. Well, thank you so much. I am so appreciative. Libraries are centers of thought, education, and communication, places where we can all engage in an intergenerational way. So I am so excited to be sitting here talking to you all today about some of my favorite things. Now, when we think of gardening victoriously, we think of this old term, this kind of term is coming back into our language today as we're sitting here in the middle of a global Pantene commercial. I do not like to use the word pandemic, so I'm going to use other P words. Make sure y'all are keeping up. So when we are in that, we are seeing people returning to gardening. They are returning to trying to get that victory garden feel, trying to grow something big and beautiful. And as we're getting <clears throat> deeper into our spring season, we're going to be all around the world doing what we can to get our seeds started. So we're gonna talk about growing plants. We're gonna start some seeds and some, some rhizomes here. We're gonna talk about soils and stuff. We're gonna be propagating some things. I have herbs around me, I have different types of growing medias here, some pots, some seedlings I started, a glass of water for me to drink. It's gonna be phenomenal. Um, general house rules, there are no such thing as student questions. If you have any question, no matter how simplistic you think it is, ask that question. I want to hear from you. Um, again, because I cannot see the camera and or my phone screen, I have my camera woman operating it so effortlessly. If you all do have a question, you can either wait until the end or you can put it in the chat and my camera woman will read it off to me. Um, additionally, if you are so inclined, you can unmute yourself and ask your questions too. Okay? So we are going to get started. Before we grow any plants, before you ever get your seeds seeding and your plants planting, you have to start with your dirt. Your dirt is this growing media that you're gonna be using in order to get your beautiful things. Now, typically when I do a dirt talk, I talk about the differences between everything and I try to use the word dirt, but we're gonna use it today because that's what a lot of us call it. Um, dirt can be anything. This here that you all can see is a heavy mix of your typical garden soils you would typically get from your house plants, from your miracle Grow, from your big box stores. This contains a lot of cool things, little white pieces of perlite, he says, trying not to drop it, little white pieces of perlite that help with drainage and aeration. Your soil sometimes needs to be able to drain and let off water. Aeration means air going into your soil, roots need that. It has a peat moss base, which is phenomenal. And because I add other stuff to my soils, it also has other organic matter and soil, uh, sand and fertilizer mixes and other thing else I add to my soil. Typically people will say, what's the best to use? I'll typically direct people to get cocoa core, which is mostly what this is beside me. This is a ton of cocoa core that I got for like $20 off of Amazon. It was, I think 10 pounds again for like $20. It was a good deal. Um, you soak it, it expands, you get a lot of it. And it's something that is more friendly to nature than peat moss. If you can only afford peat moss, if you can only get accessibility to peat moss, do that, do that. However, if you can, if you can't afford it, or if you see it in the store for cheap, get it. Coco Core, C-O-I-R, is this phenomenal media that is made of coconut shells. They basically take coconut shells and they grind them down and they make a beautiful media. This is more easily renewable than going into peat moss bogs, these swamps where they have to basically remove this peat moss from its habitat and sell it to us after, you know, whatever processing and additional things to add to it. Again, both of these are organic, but one is just a little bit more friendly for the environment. So with that being said, I have this. Some of you who are a little more fancy, like myself, you may also get worm castings. This product is not sponsored by me in any way. I literally just bought this for the class and I'm trying to get a little more accustomed to using different products. Worm castings are basically worm poop. It's really the only way I can think to describe it. And this worm poop 
is organic. It's what you can generally get in your raised beds already just by allowing earthworms to come through. If you have compost piles and those worms are coming in in your compost piles, you can um, have that run through as well. Speaking of compost, I have a big bag and then this white miscellaneous bag it is compost from my local community garden. Um, they get it from a local source. So it does have earthworms in it as well. And then finally, but not leastly, from the job place, I have coffee grounds. Coffee grounds are a phenomenal source of um, nitrogen, nitrogen. And I forgot one more thing, but I do not see it directly around me. It's a big, heavy bag of sand, but I feel like it is way over behind me and I'll be probably grabbing that eventually. Okay, because it's it's heavy and my camera woman won't be able to pick that one up. So, do y'all have any questions while I grab this bag of sand? Because that's the one thing I don't have around me. Any questions? Someone asked about eggshells. Eggshells are eggshells are beautiful. They can add calcium to your um your mix. Where did that bag of sand go? Oh, it's in the closet. The eggshells can add calcium to your um, growing operations here. Sand. I didn't say what it was. Uh, so you can take your breakfast leftovers, your eggshells, throw them in the oven at 350 for an hour to sanitize them, throw them into your blender, throw them into a zip top bag and crush them down in frustration. And you can use those to add calcium to your um, soils, your medias, or whatever. If you have tomatoes you're growing, um, Miss um, Louisa, that's not her name. That's yeah. not her name. The, the, oh, it is her name? I try to keep names. Louise. Miss Louise, thank you. I added an extra syllable. I'm Southern. Please forgive me. Miss Louise. Um, mentioned having tomatoes earlier in this chat before we got up and recorded. So tomatoes can often have an issue where the the bottoms of that fruit will turn black. And sometimes you can avoid that by using eggshells to add that calcium that stops that thing called blossom end rot from happening. So you could do that with your eggshells. You said somebody asked about why I'm using um, coffee grounds? How you use them. Uh -huh. Okay, adding worms to my compost bin and or raised beds. Yes, you can definitely do that. If you are buying worms, like you're just finding any of your local worm sellers, um, there's a lot of Facebook groups out here, Instagram chats. Try to find someone who is local to you and support that small business. You can definitely add earthworms to your raised beds, your compost piles or whatever. Or if you already have a compost pile that is, again, touching the ground, those worms are going to add themselves for you. They're going to be moving on up into the east side, a deluxe apartment called your compost in the sky. When we talk about um, using these coffee grounds, you can use them as a top dressing. So you can sprinkle them in on top or as you'll see me do today, pardon, we will be um, mixing this into my starting mix. When I use coffee grounds, I try not to use a whole bunch because nitrogen can burn your plants, causing issues in your plants. Um, and we don't want that issue. Again, any of these mixes that you'll see me make here or on my social media platforms, you will always see me try to explain why I mix things a certain way because I want nutrients to be available for my plants Ergo, having the castings, the coffee grounds, and the compost. However, I also want to make sure I'm not adding a whole bunch of crazy stuff in at once. It's just like if you go and you send a child into a candy store and you say, eat all your heart's content, that child will probably eat themselves sick. We don't want that. We just want to be able to say, okay, well, these things are available, but we can give them to you as needed. Okay? So we're going to begin. We're going to begin with one of my favorite things to grow here in North Carolina. One of my favorite things to grow here in North Carolina is these little bad boys here. Some of you who are um, going to your local grocery stores, your health food markets may see these things that seem to be new. They're called sunchokes. These sunchokes are little tuber-like um, bumps of joy really that taste nutty and slightly starchy like a potato when cooked um typically 
You can see them in the stores around this size. However, they can often be bigger when you grow them yourselves. They are a native here to North Carolina. They are a sunflower. They're actually a sunflower. The common name for them is Jerusalem artichoke. The scientific name for any of you wondering is Helianthus tuberosa. Um, and again, you can say Jerusalem artichoke or sun chokes and you'll come to this on the Google. I'm gonna start these because again, I like to eat them and I like to grow things that I eat. So we're going to begin. I'm going to grab a pot. I have this pot here. Again, any pots that I use, plastic or ceramic or terracotta, I try to think of what am I putting into this pot and what is this thing going to be once it's grown. If I'm not familiar with it, then I'll do what I can, but I try to think ahead of, of what's going on. So these bad boys can handle a swampy area, so really I can just use all of this peat moss straight up. I don't have to cut it with any sand to add for drainage issues. I don't really have to add any castings or anything because they can handle a low nutrient environment. I'm still gonna add a little castings and a little of this compost just to kind of give them a fighting chance to get started. They're not gonna stay in this pot, but this is just me getting them started indoors. That way, once the weather really normalizes a little bit more, I'll take them outdoors. Okay, so I have my second container here. These are like oil drainage pans you can get from your Dollar Tree, your local um, place of cheap cheaperies. And I'm basically gonna put two parts of peat into said container. I'm going to open up my worm casting. Ooh, it's not tearing off perfect at all. <laughs> I'm going to use my pair of scissors that are somewhere near me and open this container here because sometimes things just don't work out, party people. Do I test my soil before I add amendments? No. Any of my soils I use are recycled throughout the year. So I add a little bit of something every year to keep them fresh, to freshen them up. Would I recommend that for you? If you have your local cooperative extension and they will test your soil for free, you can definitely do that. Um, that is something that can happen here. <laughs> this is not opening at all, this is crazy. This is something that can happen here in Durham County where I am, I am in Durham, North Carolina. However, um, as a botanist, I've never had to before. Um, typically the plants I grow are either big and showy, so they take up a lot of those nutrients or they're heavy vegetables that just need a lot of extra anyway. Um, and I, the way I blend my soil mixes now, I try not to have to resort to adding liquid fertilizers unless I'm just like, I really want y'all to speed up a little bit because I don't want to overload the environment with whatever runoff could happen. So if I don't get this open soon, party people, we're gonna not use worm castings at all. And here it is. Look at that, it happened. So these worm castings are again, just a black um, leftover, a residue of the worms eating our leafy bits, our leafy greens. Again, if you're starting a compost pile or you're using vermi compost, you know, composting methods, you can get this by giving them your your vegetable scraps that are not oily or greasy, no milk, no meat, things like that. And you can eventually get this. So I'm going to put a scoop of this in here. And some people will often ask, hey, Derek, can I use gloves to do all this? Because I see you're not. And I'll say, of course you can. I just like to feel the dirt in my hands because that's a part of my character. And then I'm also gonna add a scoop of this compost. Let me say who? Move the pots, okay. The compost is pretty much a similar composition of this um, worm castings. These are local, again, sourced compost, organic matter, things like that. A little bit of vermicompost in there just because of what happens. I am going to mix this up to get a nice consistency. Again, I want 
this to not be just clumps of organic matter or clumps of peat, but I want a little bit of it distributed all throughout. And as y'all can see, colors are shifting and changing. And what was once dark black is now turning to more of a brown. Again, in my peat mix that I reuse because I do recycle my soils by just reusing them over and over again. There is a little bit of sand in here and I typically don't add more unless I notice my plant is like not draining well or I need something, another um, setup for plants that like it dry. But that is more for my house plants. So now that I fill this up, I'm gonna fill this pot up these do not need to be buried super deep. Typically, you would bury rhizomes and such um, a couple of inches under the dirt. But I'm basically going to bury them. I'm going to fill this pot up to a little bit below this line here. So there's a little bit of a line. You probably can see it, hopefully, in this pot. In most of your pots you get, there's a little line that kind of tells you, hey, fill me up to this point and don't fill me up anymore. So that way, when you water, dirt just doesn't splash everywhere. So I'm going to fill up to a little bit below this line, which would be about a half inch to an inch below this line. So that way I can put them in and then cover them up with dirt. Okay. And so you can use a coffee filter on the bottom of these if you want. I typically have filter paper, but I did not pick any up before I got here. That's the one thing I did not grab, mainly because Derek got his vaccine shot today. So excitement. Again, about a half inch to an inch below. I'm going to set two of these in, three of these in to this pot. And I'm gonna cover them up with my mixture. Again, gardening victoriously is just this easy. I am setting something up for the future using just regular mixes. Now, some of you may say, do I have to mix my soil up? Do I have to, can I just buy something that's in a bag? You can buy your miracle Grow box mixes or your miracle Grow bag mixes. You can buy your um, healthy soils and all these other name brands, organic and organic. You can buy any of these mixes and use them. I mix soils myself. So that way I can know that they work for my environment as far as my outside, my outdoors, and for me as far as how I irrigate and water. Okay? You say who now? Do we have any questions? Oh. Garden lime in the fall, it depends on when you were adding it. If you were adding garden lime in the fall and you're adding it for the pre the next year, then no, that is not bad. Um, sometimes I will add when I do raised beds. And again, party people, I wanted to be outdoors. Um, the weather is cooperating, but it gets dark quick. So I wasn't able to do that like I wanted to. But when I do grow and raise beds, I can turn the beds over um, after a growing season. So if I don't have anything else in that bed, I can kind of turn the bed over just to kind of freshen it up a little bit and prepare it for whatever next growth I have. And while I'm doing that, I can add a mid mix, things that, that, that uh, plants might need to feed off of, like my coffee grounds or other organic matter that I can add through. Garden lime, any slow release fertilizers, anything that I need, I can then add and just have them sitting there and wait for the next year. Um, typically though, I try to wait until a month or so before I start planting. So that way, as it's raining and water's coming down, I don't lose a lot of, of the try of my, my material out of the soil. So let me explain that here. I was hoping somebody would ask this question. So, To your no, the other way. On that shelf there is a uh, right at the top is a mason jar. Yeah, thank you. And I'm gonna have that rolled to me. Yeah, look at that. It's like magic off screen, huh? So when you are growing in a pot or you are growing in the ground and you're adding organic matter to your um 
any slow release fertilizers, any organic matter, any regular fertilizers, or you're just watering like a miracle grow and you're doing that, you are adding something that's going to be suspended, held up within your soil. So this is a transparent pot here. This transparent pot, I'm going to water with some of my drinking water here because why not? And as we water it, hopefully, because I, I thought about this as I was planning this, you'll be able to see it drip through. And we're gonna collect some of this water and look at it to see what it looks like. This water, again, I just drank is clear, but when I have rain come through, floods like we go through here in North Carolina, that can wash things away out of my soil. And if it hasn't had time to be processed by local critters, plants or weeds that try to take over your cover crops, we could end up getting not just dirty water, but water that has that, that residue left over in it. So I am a botanist, but I do care about the environment as well. So this is an environmental tip. I wait a month so that way in that month, all of this, this washover, all of this, this residue that looks harmless, it's dirty water, right? We're gonna see that anyway, but it now has a bunch of nitrogen in it from these coffee grounds I put in. That's gonna wash away and get into our waterways. That gets into our waterways and all of that nitrogen can cause these things called red algal blooms. And that's where basically the algae that are there within a water source get a lot of nitrogen and gets happy and wants to party, party, party. And it sucks up all of the air, all of the oxygen out of that water source. All of the, the animals, the, the insects, whoever that need that oxygen in that water source die because th this is washed away. Now, we don't ever think about this unless we're like, like the coast and learn about these things, but this can be something that can be potentially deadly. And especially when I think of my own self, I live here in a two-story apartment on the second floor rather of the apartment. When rain does hit my patio, that water I know goes directly to the waterways. The sewers tell me they do. So again, if you're not gonna be growing for another month or so, just wait if you can. Just be a little patient and wait to, to put that amendment, whatever it is, into your brace bed, even if it's organic. Let's just wait so that way we don't flub up the environment. Okay? How do you avoid pesticides? So pesticides can be organic or inorganic. And there's a website you can go, O as in op, Oliver, M as in Meringue, R as in Robert, I as in intelligent.org, which is the Organic Materials Review Institute website. Um, you can basically see pesticides, insecticides, fungicides, they're organic and find them for usage there. There are some pests that are difficult to treat with organic um, pesticides. And sometimes in order to save a crop, if you're growing for a community garden, for example, and you're trying to feed people, sometimes you kind of have to, I've seen this happen where you've kind of had to break your morals to save this food and treat with like um, a heavy pyrethrin concentration. So that way you can kill thrips off of tomatoes. Um, so this does happen sometimes, but if you're a home grower and you can take maybe losing those cabbages, try the organic method and go for it. I do either, but, um, it just depends on what I have access to. And access is important when we talk about organic stuff, because some organic things are great for the environment, but not great for our pockets. So as I always say, if that is, if that access is not afforded to you for whatever reason, then that is okay. Use whatever you can to um, keep your financial security secure. Cool, cool. So we planted these sunchokes. Now we are going to do some transplanting. So I'm gonna do some transplanting of these beautiful tomatoes. Again, I talk about securities of a financial nature because some of us want to grow and some of us feel like it's expensive. And I used to be that same way. Luckily enough now, Places like Dollar Tree, Family Dollar, these kind of, you know, low price, no price stores have gardening things that come in during the spring, at least here in North Carolina. I hope it's the same way in New York. These are tomatoes and a 
caster bean that I started. This setup here is a tray with a little plastic dome over it. You put it in a sunny window, a south facing window, and it grits your humidity going. The humidity helps your seeds be all happy and perky. And you can get some good starts like I did here. I put these in here, I believe, last week, if that. And my seedlings are coming up. I was a little nervous because earlier this week there was nothing. But Tuesday, somebody say Tuesday, I had my seedlings. So here they are. We're going to get them started. When you're handling seedlings, you want to handle them like children. You want to handle them like infants. Because if I break this stem, this is dead. There's no saving this at this stage. These are tomatoes here, these little green spits. And again, this little kind of red pinkish thing you hopefully see here is a castor bean. They are gentle. So I'm not going to sling them around. I'm going to be real, real gentle. Usually I use a chopstick but I wanted to try to do it with the bare hands. So we're gonna go for it. Before I get this started, I'm gonna get my mix together. I already added a little bit of water to this, which is great. Pre-wetting mixes is tight. So that way you don't have to water it in and disturb the soil. So I'm gonna mix that in and kind of see how it looks. The way I can know if my mix is wet enough is I can squeeze it and if it kind of holds its form before breaking apart, it is just wet enough. I don't want it to be super firm. If you get it that way, it's okay. If it is super firm, you add a little bit more of a dry material to it and that can help it kind of lighten up. If it's not wet enough, you just add a little bit more water. Okay, so whoops. He knocked some over, it's all right. I'm gonna add a little bit of these worm casings again to it. I don't often go in direct measurements because again, you can follow the instructions listed, but I usually try to go kind of a one to two. It's one part of my amendment and then two parts of whatever base soil mix I have here. So that way I'm not overriding these bad boys with um, too much nutrients at once. So I'm gonna mix this up. I'm gonna get my pots together and then we're gonna transplant these and take a little bit more questions. So on my pots here, some people get tags and they put tags into their pots, these little tags you can get. You can get old window blinds, like the old, um, I think the Venetian blinds, and you can cut them up and write tags on them. I am very clumsy. Derek is gonna tell you that. So I just write on the pot what it is in a permanent ink marker. That way when I look later, cause I've had this happen where I start a bunch of seeds, I put a bunch of tags in here. I don't know if this happened to y'all and then Something happens because Steve Urkel is my half cousin and I knock all of the labels <laughs> out. And the next thing I know, I have to sit and wait. And because I pay attention, I'm a botanist. I can eventually say, okay, this is a loofah. This is a birdhouse gourd. This is this, this is that. But I have to wait forever to be like, oh, okay, this is who you are. So I just write it on the pot in a marker. You can use your typical Sharpies, whatever markers you got, and you can write on the pot, because the pot, if, the, if all the dirt falls out of all these pots, that's a bigger problem. But this label isn't gonna just fly away because of the wind or rain. So this is a little pro tip from me, Derek, the, the crazy botanist. I'm gonna fill this pot up again. I'm filling up to this ring here. This ring is letting me know this is the amount of soil I need to put in. I get it there. It's a little bit above it, but it's okay. It's all right. And I'm gonna scoop one of these bad boys up. I'm gonna use my finger and go underneath to kind of dislodge it. And whoops, grab her here. I see another seedling here that's starting. So I'm gonna grab that one too. I have this seedling here. Such a lovely zoom feature. And you can almost even see the little seed that opened up here, but we're not gonna go too deep. I'm gonna stick my finger a nub or two into this hole that I made. I'm gonna bury it where that seedling can be buried, not all the way, even though you can do that for a tomato, we're not gonna do that here today, at least not for this one. And I'm gonna gently, very gently with my thumbs here, push everything down. Now I have big hands, I'm 6'2". So if you have to use your fingers, you can gently, just gently push the soil down. So now you've tucked your plant in. 
You don't want to leave them untucked because again, you start watering, that soil is untucked, it's going to shift and move and you, you now have a roller coaster effect happening for your seedling. We don't want that. Okay, now again, and I'm making sure these are actually written because I, I put them in a certain order here. There we go. So again, I'm going to fill this up. Two nubs of my finger. Boop. The hole may be too big, but it's okay. I'm going to gently pull this one up. And this one, again, because they're tomatoes, I can actually bury them all the way to the top leaves. Those top two leaves are called cotyledons, and I can actually bury them all the way up to that. I'm not going to do that just now <clears throat> because I just, I don't feel like it, but you can if you want to. And then I'm going to bury, not bury, I'm going to do another two tomatoes in one pot. Again, I can transplant these later. I'm going to have to, but I basically grew these for myself and some friends, hopefully. Once the panda bear is over, I'll be able to see some friends yes. and give them these tomatoes that I grew with love and care. And again, I'm just gently, gently doing this with the seed. I've seen people use like little wooden tools to kind of do this. You can do that as well. Okay. And then lastly, my castor bean. Oh, I see two of them. How about that? I see two of them that sprouted. I love three. Ah, hot dogs. I see three castor beans, one, two, and then three here. I'm gonna put all three of these in the same pot. I love castor bean plants. Um, some of us who are, some of us, some of you who are older in the older generation used to have to take castor oil as a supplement given to you by your family. Say, say that again. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm gonna keep going. I'm, I'm sorry, we're just having some difficulty. We can't even see anything. So we're listening. I didn't realize you could hear me. I'll be quiet. No problem. <laughs> can the rest of you, you said you can't see anything. Can the rest of you see me? I can see you, yes. You might um, want to change your viewing options up in the top. You can't, there's okay. a drop down menu um, where you us. can click, you know, view who's talking or view everyone. So you might want to play along with, the, um, with those settings. Okay. Yes. Because I want and you to I'm, be able to see me now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited about these castor beans. I don't even know. So I love, I'm a storyteller. For those of you who, who follow me or, you know, to the, the beautiful librarians who have contacted me, I'm a storyteller. And I don't think I've told them any stories. So here we go. These castor beans are a mix of castor beans that I got from a friend of mine I used to work with, a cool woman named Maggie. She's like one of my little aunties. And seeds that I got from my local or my local university I went to my alma mater NC State I've seen these beautiful ethereal just crazy looking seed pods growing and I said let me take some of these seeds by take I mean borrow to never give back some of these seeds and I kept them in a box and I forgot I had them I thought I didn't have any more castor seeds and God bless it when I moved I found them and I planted them down, hoping they're old, but maybe they'll come back. And here we go. So this is phenomenal. Again, using my little finger here, I'm gonna dig under it. And we can see just how big this thing is. I dislodged a couple of the roots, but it is okay. I'm gonna widen this hole a little bit and plant this down, covering up those roots. And because it is still white, meaning it hasn't developed chlorophyll yet, I'm gonna actually cover this with a little dirt. I'm gonna lightly tap this so it looks back what it did. It's like I'm an artist, right? It looks back how it did when I pulled it out. I'm actually just gonna put one in here because they are a little bigger. And I'm gonna leave these alone because I'm gonna have to rewrite more pots for my casters. And Derek doesn't remember where his marker is. Do we have any questions right now? Yes, I had a question. question a little while ago. Oh, someone had a question. What you got for me? Uh, I'm Neo and I have a garden uh, on my rooftop. But problem is uh, I want to do it organic, uh, organic ways. But uh, uh, I talked here uh, with uh, some agriculture officer, but they cannot give me any, any kind of information of or, uh, about organic garden. 
so my question is if i want to transfer this garden in organic way so what uh, what is the first uh, uh, thing i i have to do okay so you are, are you the young lady in bangladesh yes <clears throat> okay so here in the united states we have a thing called the or the um horticultural no cooperative extension office cooperative extension helps us with a lot of information but i've learned last year <clears throat> year and a half ago that that doesn't exist across at least in canada so i'm learning that doesn't exist everywhere um, if you do have any local agricultural offices it sounds like you don't i would hit them up but if you do not then the first thing you would think of if any of you are trying to go organic is your soil. Again, we started with the dirt here because this is where everything springs forth. If you are trying to go organic, you start there. Really, you start with why am I trying to go organic? Am I trying to help the environment? Do I just want to help myself? What am I looking for here? And once you get to that place, you say, hey, this is where what I can do to, to reach that within my, again, means, my resources, whatever. The products I'm using here, I bought these worm castings. Yeah. This compost was free because I'm I'm friends with uh, people at local cooperative cooperative extension and the local community garden. And these coffee grounds were free because they're just spent coffee grounds. So if you have any um, refuse that you can compost, you can start a compost pile. You can get your coffee grounds and your eggshells. Like I said earlier, you can take your eggshells, grind them down. You can use those. There's different um, composting methods, whether you're using worms, whether you're using fungi, like in the Bokashi method, or anything else to help you get in that organic endeavor. And then once you have your media, your soil, you know, whether it's in a pot or something that you're growing um, <clears throat> in a raised bed, wherever, once you have that set up, then the next stage is your seeds. Any of your seed packets you can get, like these will often say whether they're non-GMO or whether they are organic in nature. Usually organic seeds cost more. <clears throat> I feel like you can just buy regular seeds, grow them organically, save those seeds, and you have organic seeds, right? However, um, you can do either of those things. When it comes to talking organic, I know the, pr the principles, I know what to do, but it's not something I truly practice because accessibility is important to me. And I want the, the people that I service within my local community to have accessibility to things and be able to recreate what I do. Again, I get this, these, these things because I do have some ability to buy them, but I try to do a little bit more of what regular people, not regular people, most people would be doing who may not understand right. um, the organic way. Did that answer your question? Yeah, um, I have another question that is uh, about pesticide because maximum people here uh, all are what using uh, medicine and uh, they don't use the pesticide from organic. Huh. So my trying is I'm trying to use all the uh, natural pesticide for my uh, garden and for my trees, but. Uh, Unfortunately, it's not possible to get this type of pesticides. I have to use the chemicals. So how I uh, change it, and I want to do it, this, uh, all the pesticides will come from nature. This is my problem. Because my garden is totally uh, caught by white flies. I'm suffering okay. for this. You said white flies? Yeah, white flies. Ooh, I, so I got a remedy for your white fly problem. You ready? Yeah. I want you to go to your local store. I want you to find a flamethrower. I want you to burn everything because that's uh, that's the only organic way I can think of of getting rid of white flies. White flies, for those of you who don't know, are a terrible pest. They pet they terrorize like um different crops that we all love, different brassicas, if I remember right different things like a tobacco, hemp, for any hemp farmers, people who are into that, or it's crazy cousin weed, they do a lot of, um, of attacking there. And because these insects, these pests have evolved to just be able to survive, they can reproduce quickly and they can reproduce in high numbers. And again, when it comes, like I mentioned earlier, when it comes to dealing with organic pesticides, there are some bugs that are like, oh no, and they die. 
And there are some that will just shake it off. And they'll be like, hey, that's the best you got. So it may sometimes be necessary, depending on what you're trying to do, to go to either or an inorganic pesticide or to use a cultural method. Like we go through by hand and we kill all these bugs and we remove all this up and we, we do scouting and remove infected plants. But if you're talking about fruit trees, because you don't have the liberty to move them around like you would plants in a greenhouse or even, you know, killing your plants in a raised bed, like culling that tomato because it has all these horn, these hornworms. It, it may be necessary to use an inorganic product. Look into that product and see what it is composed of and try to, to learn in the best way how those chemical components can potentially affect you. Even in an inorganic product or an organic product, you usually have a cool down period where you have to wait a certain amount of days to eat those fruits, to take those herbs, to eat those leaves of cabbage or whatever. So that is my answer. It, it, I don't have a, a stop all end all because there are some people who will tell you to use these products organically and they'll work or these inorganic products that work. Either way can work. Both options are realistic, but sometimes we just have to kind of tap dance the line. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Any other questions in the chat? Yes, there's one. It's um, about the soil there's mix one. that you created. The soil mix would that it, I created. Yeah. Would it work for your starter seedlings? And then you just keep transferring them into the garden once they are big enough. Exactly. So this mix I make is adapting now because, again, this is the first time I'm using worm castings. I have a good friend of mine. Again, if you have gardening friends, if you want me to be a gardening friend, follow me on Instagram. But if you have gardening friends, hit them up because they told me, I've had friends who have told me different products they use, so I'm trying them now to see what's up. But I just have one standard mix I use that just follows that plant for the life of it. So you can definitely use it as a seed starter. If you want, you can also get a seed starter mix. I have one I bought from like the family dollar or the Dollar Tree rather, and it's just like, fluff it's just fluffy soil um no nothing in it something like this just a fluff and you can usually put your plants in that as well but again for me i make these mixes because i know i equate watering plants to love some of us do that where we just get bored and we love our plants and we water them and then we don't know why our seeds didn't come up because we watered them to death and they rotted the seeds rotted or the plant rotted the rhizome rotted so i make these mixes to hold water so I know they hold water and to drain a little bit so I don't kill these people when I'm bored. These plants, I mean, when I'm bored. I, I have a question. People, it's okay. I'm sorry. What's up? I have a question about the rose. Last year was my first time gardening and I made these hills. I call them rows that I put mm -hmm. the up uh, on. I really don't want to do that again. That's hard work. So I was wondering if I could use the weed block, you know, get that weed block material. Uh, I hope it doesn't the rot fabric. the fabric. Yeah, whatever it is. It's meant for gardens, I think. Yeah, yeah, you uh, can definitely use that. Um, there is plant. another method that you can use. So you can definitely take your weed box. So she's talking about horticultural fabric, really. And it's a fabric that you use in your landscape. And you can basically put it down to cover up your um, your land, your garden area, whatever, and then mulch on top of it, whatever. and um, that stops those weeds that are under that fabric from coming up quickly. Additionally, if you don't have access to that, you can get cardboard, wet newspapers. Some people use trash bags or old plastic bags, old paper bags, and you can put them down as well. Typically, even when you start a, a um, raised bed, you can put like a, a cardboard box under it. And you can even put a cardboard box on top of your garden and just like cut out what you need. The other thing you can do, which, helps you to get a little bit more in your space because I remember you talking you had like a you said a 27 by 15 25 is 25 I, I almost had it I almost had it <laughs> is square foot gardening square foot gardening is made by a gentleman or it's founded by a gentleman named Nell Bartholomew he wrote a book he was an engineer basically that got into gardening when he retired and basically in a square foot block he puts like a certain amount of like vegetables plants flowers whatever into that block and that helps you to get a lot of plants in your area that can then crowd out your um, weeds. You may still have some weeds because I didn't fill mine all the way up, but it can help you to at least get a big, 
benefit and maximum effort out of your out of your garden. Was there a question in the chat you had, Stacey? She was about oh, she did. Okay, that's there's it. There's a follow-up question one. to that one, though. Um, follow-up question to that one. Yes, would it be bad um, to have like different soils if you have your indoor, you know, starter seed and then you're putting it in an outdoor raised bed? No, it's not bad at all. You can you can literally put any of your gardening soil or your peat moss mixes into your raised beds. Um, again, I, I do basic mixes of everything because I'm growing indoor and outdoor plants. So in this frame, you can kind of see a couple of my indoor plants. This one's looking a little sad because I don't like it. So I'm not giving it a lot of attention but I have a lot of different plants that require different needs. Some want to drain out a little bit more, so I add more sand. Some just want to be, you know, loved and wet, so I add a little bit of extra stuff for that. So that's why I have these these mixes, these, these bases. But again, you could get your seed starter mix, put that whole seed starter mix into your um, raised bed. You can get your garden soil mix in the big bags, and you can just start that, your seeds in that, throw it in your raised bed. You can do it all. It's up to you. The thing I would say is like the small bags like orchid mix or the cactus mix. Those things you typically do not want to put in your beds because those are, are more, more um, centered for those types of plants from orchids and uh, your, your dry loving plants. And unless you're growing a garden bed full of them, that's not going to be what you want. All hearts and minds are clear. Okay. I don't see anything so, box. so here's what we're going to do now. In the same pot I dirtied up, I'm going to start some seeds because we talked about seed starting mix. This seed starting mix is again already moist. I don't really need to add anything else to it. It has this organic matter in it. Again, I'm using one mix for everything. Some people, again, use five different mixes, and that's perfectly fine. Derek doesn't, and he gets his results. Whatever works for you works for you. So, I am going to fill this up because I'm going to start some seed. I'm going to start some seed. I love lavender. I hope you all love lavender too. If so, put it in the chat for me, please. And I'm going to start these lavender seeds. Anytime I start seed, especially herbs, because I have a bad streak with herbs, I always read the packets. The front of the packet tells you what it is. It gives you an idea of what it looks like. The back of the packet tells you what to expect so the days of germination how deep to put these seeds and other little things to keep in mind so this tells me to put them a fourth of an inch deep it tells me to space them a certain amount it takes 10 to 28 days to germinate lavender takes a long time to germinate which is why i typically don't grow from seed herbs because i'm impatient and i typically just go to my local farmer's market and i just get these seeds so I'm going to safely, with this pair of scissors, cut the seed pack open. And I get out my lavender seeds. These seeds are not as bodacious as other things I could show you, but they're just small little black seeds, just small little insignificant things. I'm going to put them on top of my soil and literally just cover them up and pat them dry. Here is the big ticket. Here is the big thing. Here is the major key, the factoid to keep in mind. When you're starting seeds, like I did over here, and you're going to water them, sometimes we may use a mason jar, a bucket, a watering hose to water. I have a spray bottle here. I'm just going to spray this to wet it up. I don't want necessarily water to drip out of the bottom of this. But I'm going to get this top layer where the seeds are wet. Those seeds are going to soak in that water here. I don't need water to the bottom of this pot right now, but those seeds are going to soak up water here. This mixture is wet, it's moist. So I'm going to do this here. Derek. I'm, yes. Speaking of water, someone wrote in the chat box that Can they you have trust what? Um, Dollar store seeds to germinate. You can, kind of. Germination rates for a um, for seeds can go lower as the years go on on this seed packet. It tells me that these seeds 
come from the year 2012 that's on the back or they're good by 12 of 2021 rather so as the years go past as it gets closer to, to december of this year um which is again 2021 this the germination rates can go down i have gotten some good growth off of dollar tree seeds i used to when i tell you i would run into the dollar tree with a hot paycheck and i would buy all the seeds and grow some good stuff i could get some good seeds growing but there are some times where I would lose off a little bit too. Those seeds may be old. They may they German. They might not have been kept in the right conditions. I probably did something wrong. But you can definitely trust them to get something. I've gotten the best sunflowers from there. What other questions, Stacy? Uh, she has a uh, raised bed that's not draining. A raised bed that's not draining. Again, you can add. Um, I mean, playground sand, you can definitely add into your mixes here. Like you can just go to your local big box store, get a, box, a bag of playground sand and mix it in. And that'll help with drainage. Um, if you have enough gumption and some people to help you, you can dig under the bed and add a product called like bowl block or rototill. Um, I think I'm, I'm not killing that name for the second product, but they're basically like broken up gravel pieces that you can add and or you can just change your raised bed setup so if you're using more of wood you can use like concrete slabs or something that's that's not a solid sheet of wood so that way water can escape the side of your raised bed what other questions we got stacy when, when do you start planting for zone seven my seven my zone depends on what you're planting for the stuff that i'm going to be planting in the spring i actually start these seeds as y'all are seeing now I'm starting them indoors. These mints and herbs and stuff I have, and I have some more around me and in this house, I can actually put outdoors because they will be able to handle our weather, but I'm afraid of getting a frost. and I don't want to lose this growth that either I bought from the store or this growth that I got in here. But typically I start everything indoors under grow lights. Again, if you don't have grow lights, you can put them in a south facing window. If you're like, Derek, how do I know whether my window is facing south or north? All of us have smartphones, right? For the most part, all of us have smartphones. Our smartphones will tell us with the compass app that comes with every smartphone, what direction your window is. You just literally open that compass up and you point it at that window. And again, I like here, I have Western facing windows. So I get a lot of sun, a lot of light in this house. This living room comes in and it feels like uh, who done it and why in here in the summer, because it's just hot and it's bright, but my plants love it. So I hope those answer your questions. Do we have any other questions? Okay, now, okay, continue. And I, I heard someone else trying to read a question. Was that the same question I answered? Yes. Okay, beautiful. This is great. I'm loving this. I'm having fun. I hope you all are. So we just started seeds. <clears throat> um, you can start in your zone seven, a lot of different seeds. For those of you who are like, what zone am I in? You can look it up on the USDA website. Um, not the USDA website. Actually, I think you can. The USDA website, you can look up your horticultural zone or your, no, you're not a horticultural zone, your USDA zone. You can look that up and see what zones you're in. Once you figure that out, you can then say, okay, when do I start sunflowers or cabbages or onions in this zone? For those of us, again, in the United States, you can go to your local cooperative extension office, your, your local source of information. And you can say, hey, when do I start these things? If you Google it, they usually have a seed starting guide of when to start these vegetables, when to start these flowers, how to plant these things up. And they'll tell you how to do that within your area. And especially if Pachogue Medford is giving you seeds, like get those free seeds, look at those packs, see what they have online, hit up Cooperative Extension or myself, be like, hey, I'm trying to grow these, you know, what tips, tricks can you give me? And grow to your heart's content. Grow as much as you possibly can. Cool, cool. We're going to be repotting some plants. I'm going to be repotting two plants. So repotting plants, again, we're pretty much using the same stuff here. Nothing is too um, grandiose here for what I'm doing today because, oh, I forgot this had stuff in it. I broke a cup, everyone, and I got upset and I hid it in a pot because I was upset at myself and I was disappointed. <laughs> I was disappointed because I bought a cup and I was really happy and then I said I'll just glue it back together and make it into a pot and I hid it in this pot never to be seen again so 
I'm gonna clean this out real quick. I have this big, beautiful pot here. Again, I'm gonna be repotting these plants for the indoors. Oop. I am going to add one of these coffee filters that came from out of this um, bag of coffee filters to the bottom to stop soil from kind of slowing out of, slowly falling out of the bottom. Ooh, this is really long, there we go. Again, you can do that to keep a lot of dirt from just falling out until roots are truly established. And because I already have this mix started, I'm just gonna dump all of this in. I knew that wouldn't be enough. So we're gonna actually just mix on the fly here. So I'm gonna add all of this peat moss in and this cocoa core mix. I'm going to add again, a nice portion of my castings here. I'm gonna add a nice portion of my compost. And then I'm gonna add a couple of other things. Now, when I'm repotting plants, I want to make sure that I have enough media, dirt, soil, whatever, in this pot to be able to, to fill everything out. I don't want this to, to be just low to the ground. And again, I have this ring here that I'm trying to fill up to. And I wanna make sure that ring is satisfied. I don't want to just, you know, have it too low or too high because again, when you're watering these plants, I don't know how many of you have done this where you fill the, you fill the soil all the way up to the top of the pot. You water, water spills everywhere, dirt goes everywhere. And pretty soon you're like, where did all the dirt go? All the dirt is on the ground. It's in your house somewhere. So I mix this up with the old hand here, breaking up any clumps as I can. I shake it up. I'm gonna take this pot and kind of put it in to see where the line, the root line would be. So where the stem and the root kind of come out. Turn this like this. So right here would be a little higher than I want. But what I'm gonna do is carefully take this bad boy out, disturb these roots a little bit. And then again with my big hands, kind of adjust it in here to the level I want. Again, I want this to be at the level with this rim of this pot here. I am about there, so I'm gonna be satisfied. I'm gonna add one thing I did not tell y'all about. This is a mycorrhizal inoculant. Again, you don't have to use it. It's not necessary, but I use it because it's a fungus that can basically go around these roots and help my plants absorb nutrients more. <clears throat> it is something that can be beneficial, but it's not necessary. You can get some of these same relationships or nutrient absorptions by again, using a little compost or having earthworms in your pots or in your raised beds, right? I'm not gonna use a lot. I'm just trying to season the soil. Think about when you're cooking for somebody who has high blood pressure. You're not using a lot. You're just using a little bit, just a little. Just a little. I have family who has diabetes. I try not to give them a lot of sugar, but they want a lot of it. I'm going to backfill to cover up the dirt here with this regular peat moss mix. I'm not gonna add anything else to this at the top here because I have enough at the root line where things actually are. And then again, I'm doing my pressing. I'm pressing everything in. I want to make sure that my plant is stable. I'm leaving the tag in here, even though I know this is a rosemary, I'm gonna just leave the tag in here because <clears throat> this will help other people to be able to see it and identify it if they're looking at it when I'm not here. And this is it. Now I disturbed those roots because they were, as you can see, scrolling around the inside of this pot because what happens is when they grow these plants, there's space for the roots to come out and try to come out of the, there we go, of the holes here. However, most of them are just gonna spiral around the inside and become root bound of these pots. That can be an issue because your plants may not know, once you put them in a new pot, a new area, your raised bed, wherever, that, hey, these roots can be free now. We can grow other than in a circle. So you kind of disturb them so they know. You don't have to massively tear them up, but you just lightly disturb them. Okay, 
We're going to repot another plant and then we're going to do a propagation from that plant. And then I'm going to take any other questions that you all have, because I feel like that would be the last couple of things I have here. Boop. So we're going to repot another plant. I need one thing. What's that? Because I use this pot instead of the other one. I, I mixed up my pots. In that bedroom behind, actually, no, right beside you is a pot. That one? Uh-huh. I want that one because there's there's death in that pot. We're just going to take that pot. Awesome. So I'm going to be repotting this mint. Again, this is going to be kind of a cheat because this mix, I'm going to see what it looks like. Um, I used this for a house plant I had. Um, rest in peace to that house plant. It's not, it's not in here anymore. So we're going to see what it looks like. It is really sandy because it was a um, philodendron relative. So it's really sandy. It's not really something I want to have super sandy for my little planty baby here. I'm just going to set this to the side and just start from scratch. I'm going to use some cocoa core, which is over here, and fill this container up, at least the bottom of it, so I can go ahead and have a good base. Again, you can usually just fill your pot up with what you need. So you can fill your pot up straight up with what you need, like so like that, so you only make enough. Who? It's 8.05. Okay, thank you. So you can fill your pot up like so like that, so you can only make enough. You can do that too. Um, typically, I have a lot of plants, so I may not use this today, but I'll eventually use it. So I'll just add to these containers and just let it sit around. Soil doesn't really go bad unless you see like a nasty mold on it. And by nasty, I mean foul smelling, but even then it can usually be salvaged. Added a little bit of my um castings and my coffee grounds and again finally some um of my beautiful compost my beautiful compost have i been talking for an hour wow it doesn't feel like it y'all are fun i'm gonna mix this up in here breaking up any of this organic matter one thing i can say that i'm glad i haven't ran into yet is any insects Sometimes we're digging through this dirt and we run through bugs and stuff. And I'm glad because I'm a I'm not really a bug fan. <laughs> and I don't want to lose my composure here on this live. I'm not saying I'm beyond it, but I would. So this is great. So awesome. I got about there. I'm gonna fill this pot about halfway. I'm going to take my plant out which is my sweet mint. And again, disturb these roots. Now these roots are not as bound as the, um, the rosemary was. So this actually broke a little easier and I'm gonna put it down in here. It is not giving me what I need. So I'm gonna actually keep dismantling these roots a little bit because they got a really nice mix here that I don't want to try to compete with. And then I'm going to backfill by just adding soil around to get that root line back up. And pushing down. So that way I can have that half inch of space at the top. To propagate this bad boy, that was the last thing I was gonna show y'all. I could literally just rip off, cut off a couple of inches of this piece of any of this. And this thing smells so amazing. I wish y'all could smell this. I could cut off a piece of this with my scissors, my thumbnail, whatever. I take these bottom leaves off and I just put it in a pot of dirt. Whoops, I just put it in a pot of dirt. It has the word mint on it so I can know what it is later. Even though again, you can just know by the smell. I fill this pot up, boop, to the rim and then just bury this stem gently without breaking it. And then by keeping it watered and moisturized, I can have more mint to give the people, which is again, something I like to do. So it has now been a little over an hour. What questions y'all got for me? Yes, I have a question, another question. Mm -hmm. 
my last question is uh, about reporting reporting uh, when uh, i try to report my uh, soil and what what about that soil which i put in front for my uh, trees and if i want to change this uh, soil after that what uh, i want to do for for those soil okay i'm going to repeat to you what i think you're asking okay hmm. when you are taking care of a plant and you want to change the soil completely when repotting how do you do that is that what you're asking yes Okay, here's the thing. So this is not a outdoor plant. This is a ZZ plant. This is a Raven ZZ I won in a contest. If I am trying to repot this bad boy completely by taking off all of the form of soil, what I can do is literally pick it up and shake it off gently, gently now, because I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to break it. I just want to take the soil off. And some people will dunk this in water to really rinse all this soil off. I can see these beautiful rhizomes here. They're just looking at me and they're so happy. And then even, I would, I mean, we're going to pretend, we're going to play a game of pretend. We're going to pretend like this isn't the same mix. And I would take a different mix, my new mix, and I would basically fill my pot back up with that new mix. So you can um, get your soil back to bare roots, your plant back to bare roots, and, and go and fill it back up from that with new soil. That is something you can do. I typically don't do it because I'm lazy, unless I'm seeing like a big issue with my plants. And a big issue would be they're dying and the mix I made, because again, I make my own mixes for the most part, the mix I made is wrong. And then once I repot it, if it looks happy, then it's not like lopping over too much, which this is kind of leaning, but it's okay. I'll just be like, ah, I did it. So that's what you could do. You could take your trees, your fruit trees, and you could literally like dunk them in a bucket of water. You could have a bucket of water beside you, rinse all that soil off carefully, get that root system as clean as possible, and put it into a new um, growing media. That is something you can do. Okay. What about uh, the big size? Uh, I have two or three big size pots where I. Uh, uh, put some uh, lemon trees and uh, various kind of fruit trees so it's almost one year and a half i don't uh, change my soil and uh, some people uh, told me please change the soil and uh, try to change it as soon as possible but mm -hmm. i'm thinking uh, what i do about those old soil and uh, which i input in that uh, in those pots so uh -oh. i'm just separate so with your old soil you can compost it you can i just keep all my old soil in old trash cans and then i just mm -hmm. let it you know sit and i use it again again i don't really rinse off all of my soil on my plants but you can compost it some people throw it away some people throw it into the woods or the forest um, some people use it for other projects you might just rotate your plants out of one media into another but there's a lot of different opportunities you have um, again, if you, what I tell people is, I'll tell you what I do, because this class is all about what I do. These are the things that I do, these are the things you could do, but in all honesty, you could just be like, I'm not gonna do this because I do something else and that works for me. If it works for you, keep doing it. My plants mm -hmm. are just my plants. They, they're literally mine. These are not your plants. You're not, some of y'all are not in my zone. You're not in zone seven. You're not in North Carolina. You don't have the, you don't live here in this apartment where the water quality can sometimes be a little atrocious. So there's different things you have to keep in mind when you're growing your plants. But again, if somebody is suggesting that to you, try it out and see if it works for you. If you get better results, keep going. If not, go back to what you were doing. Okay, I'm talking about recycling. I want to, if I want to recycle it, how I can do it? This is my uh, question. Yeah, so like I said, with the soil, you can recycle it by composting it. You can use it for doing vermi composting with worms. You can regular compost it. There's a couple of different ways you can recycle it. If you have any friends, you can be like, hey, I got the soil. Y'all can have it. Like there's, so that's kind of upcycling. There's a lot of different things you can do. Can I use it for my new plant? You can use it for whatever you want. 
Okay. You can use it for your new plants or whatever. If you're noticing your plants are dying, and this is for any of you out there, let's say your plants are dying and you use the soil a couple of times and all those plants just keep dying, then it may be necessary to be like, look, you know, let me just put the soil to the side and see if it's me or some other thing before I just use the soil again. Like some soils or composts we have to be careful of here in Durham because um, they have plants that were composted that were treated with a herbicide. And then when we grow vegetables in them, the plants look all funny and wonky and all curly. And it just, some plants will die because of that pesticide that, that didn't compost all the way down. So it's a thing that happens, but we just have to be careful. But if it's just you recycling it because you just want to rotate, go for it. Okay. It means you okay. do not have other plants. Say it again. It should, it should not harm my other plant. It should not harm your other plant. Exactly. Again, if you do see it harming your other plant, and that's when you just say, let me throw this away. Okay. Okay. What other okay. questions we got? We got any chat questions? No chat questions. Okay. Who else has a question? I've heard two or three voices today. I know there's more of y'all out there. Somebody asked me a question. How long have you been have gardening? How long have I been gardening? I have been officially gardening since 2007. So that was 2007 until now. I started gardening at my grandmother's house. She had raised beds in the back of her um, home that was upkept by a woman who gardened until she was 98 years old. Um, so I did, I started it in 2017. I have been into plants since I can remember. So for at least 26 years. That's great, thank you. Thank you for your expertise. This was very informative. Everyone can look out for the recording of this um, just a few days probably on our YouTube channel. Any other last minute questions? Yeah, I have another one question. Sorry, okay, I'm just stopping. Um, uh, my last question is about soil. Uh, different soft soil uh, um, is very much important for plant but uh, what, which I, I learned from mm -hmm. last uh, last but uh, some soil uh, how can I measure, measure the soil which soil is best for my plant because every plant is so totally different so when you say measure the soil there's a couple of different things we can be talking about here you can get a uh, test or a kit about the you uh, water and uh, sometimes I put water very much sometimes uh, some plants want very uh, to uh -huh. water, but this type of problem I create because I have not not so not enough knowledge about how to care the plant so when you talk about water when you're talking about knowing how much water to put in the plant you can use a hydrometer h y g h y d r o M E T, I almost misspelled that one terribly. E R hydrometer or a hydrometer is how it's spelled, like water and meter. And you can use them and they can tell you how moist or dry your soil is. There's a lot of different things, even a ten a tenthometer, which is a little bit higher than what this class is talking about. It's a little bit higher level. But there's different meters you can use to measure the moisture content of your soil. Now, as far as noticing, knowing what your plants need, then that comes with a, a horticultural, agricultural background to know, okay, these plants like wet feet, as it were, wet roots, wet plants, and these plants don't. From what I've experienced, most fruit trees don't like a lot of wetness here in North Carolina in these states. But there may be some that I'm not quite familiar with or I can't remember right now that do enjoy having a nice wet soil. So researching that plant, those plants and saying, hey, these want wetness or these want dryness. Sometimes it's even experimentation, seeing what works and what doesn't work and making notes and adjusting. With these plants I have in here, the house plants, the outdoor plants, I've had to learn each of them. They're different people to me. They're different friends. And I've had to learn what each of them require to make them happy or I lose them. And losing them can be they're dying like this jerk over here or they're, that's right, this is a jerk, don't y'all judge me. Or they are happy like my beautiful philodendron goldie, which is off camera. I don't, I don't want them to see that when they're gonna be, they're gonna be really upset because they're gonna want it and they're gonna come here and try to take it from me, but I'm not gonna show it to them. 
But um, it's a beautiful play. I just need y'all to know. Um, and yeah, so that, that's really my answer for you. Um, to, to measure, there's so many different meters, sensors that you can get to see what your plant is getting as far as that environment's concerned. And then various programs, alterations, things you can do to adjust your environment to adapt or to, to reflect what you want it to be. Again, that goes more into greenhouse management and that's and more high level things that are above what this course is talking about. Okay, uh, also one more, sorry to add for this question. One mm -hmm. more is I am trying to, I'm touching uh, some foreign foods which can, which is, uh, uh, which can, uh, I bought some seed, this, Kiwi, it's kiwi. I uh, kiwi fruit. I want to kiwi, see. Yeah, okay. uh, want to uh, do this uh, kiwi fruit. But uh, but my weather is not uh, familiar with this fruit. But, uh, okay. How I go and I'm trying for this. Have any idea? So or I think your question is you have. Such so I think your question is you have a plant that you're growing that is not um, typical to your area and you're trying to figure out how to grow. Some things we just can't grow. Some things we just can't make happen. Um, I would love to be able to grow oranges and lemons outdoors, but we have frost and that just doesn't happen. So typically I would again say, especially if you're not here where again, we have cooperative extension, which is kind of a cheat sheet. Find your, your planty people, your institutions your universities that have botanical, agricultural, horticultural um, degrees, because those people will be able to tell you, hey, this is what you can do to find what fruit you can grow here. Again, you can always do trial and error, but they'll have your answers for you. And they'll tell you, hey, this is what to grow here. This is what to do there. These are the sensors we use. And they'll have the access. I have no idea about, I have no idea about this, uh, this fruit uh, because it's from New Zealand and I, uh, I honestly saying this food uh, I bought uh, from online and I'm trying uh, to make a different type food uh, garden in my play, in my home. So I'm researching on it and for this reason I'm asking how can I uh, plant uh, this kiwi food because already I am uh, just a put it including many various kind of foreign fruit trees in my garden so to answer that question and I'll, I'll end this on this when you are attempting to change the landscape the foodscape as it were of your area that without the the ability to have backing like cooperative extension like a university like a, a agriculturalist a horticulturalist an arborist a um, I can't remember what the term is for people who grow fruit trees, but though without having that backing, it is difficult because you again have to go by trial and error. Kiwi, I can grow here in North Carolina in zone 7B because they can handle our weather and I, I don't have that much of an issue. But if I am going to the future, again, I live in an apartment currently, to grow a foodscape, then I, I just have to kind of play it by ear. Because again, that ear is, what is my environment saying? What can this plant handle? Can this plant really be in my area or will it die? If it dies and I can't make it happen, I can't make it work because I have a frost or my temperatures are too much or I don't have enough water or I have too much water, then I just have to, I have to move on. Because if my foodscape's purpose is to feed people, again, this is the outside of the purpose of gardening victoriously, then my foodscape's mindset has to be, let me see what I can grow that may be exotic for people to see, for people to appreciate botanically. So in that way, I can, I can hit all my cylinders as it were. I can say, hey, I have some new fruit you can try, some new vegetables you can try. And for you as the person growing it, as the, the agriculturalist, you are not overworking yourself, trying to upkeep a plant that just won't like your area. <clears throat> Again, there's a lot of plants, like you said, kiwis in New Zealand. It's also here in North Carolina. Apples are in Asia mm -hmm. and we can also grow them here. So there's a lot of different plants that can be found in different regions that have different climates. Howsoever, 
There are some plants that we just, we just can't do. We just can't get them to work. I may not be able to get sugarcane here in this zone like I want to because sugarcane doesn't like a frost and we get real cold in these parts. So that may be a dream I may have to let uh, die. So that way from that compost, I can grow something else. Okay? Okay. 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 Any questions from the chat? No, nope, thank you so no more? much. Beautiful. The... Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. I love it and I appreciate it. Thank you all for this opportunity. I hope you all keep growing, keep going. And remember, whether you win or you lose in this gardening game, you really won overall. So just keep growing and keep doing what you got to do. Awesome. Thank you so, Thanks so much. Everybody be Bye. well. Have a good night. You're welcome. Bye-bye.